Over the past few months, many farmers have been coming out on social media to disclose the fact that they have been told by the government and the large corporations they respond to to stop their activities. They were being forced to dump their produce, such as thousands of gallons of fresh milk, as well as to slaughter their animals and turn their vegetable crops under. Ironically enough, even before this had started, the mainstream media have been announcing that the food supply chain was about to break. It seems that, at this point, making producers throw away their goods to maintain the logic of scarcity has become a new fashion for the creating problem, selling solution economic model. Meanwhile, analysts have been alerting this action to be a clear attempt in weaponizing food to keep the public tied to their services, perpetuating dependency on these institutions, therefore remaining in a constant state of fear and being held captive by the very system that defends freedom. In China, a curse that you cast on someone you really hate is, may you live in interesting times. With over 30 million Americans out of their jobs and over 60 food processing facilities facing a major outbreak amongst their workers, in addition to the permanent spoon-fed fear and panic, we can definitely say that we are living in interesting times. As the government makes its run to prove its worth by sustaining a continual state of economic emergency in order to show its role in keeping capital alive and most importantly seeking ways to make people believe that it is still the only option to keep everyone safe, the class disparities in the US are no longer only a matter of wealth and poverty, but a matter of life and death. That is to say, the establishments that take the most advantage of the work of immigrants and people of color are the same ones that failed to secure them proper work conditions to prevent the spread of the disease, let alone provide them some dignity. The shortages that are about to come won't be caused by lack in production, but by poor management since most employers haven't done enough to keep workers safe and of course they have the perfect scapegoat to put the blame on the sanitary crisis. The elites are not afraid to use their most troublesome cards to get what they want and enforce their power even further into our lives. Many economists have been opening the debate about whether it will take a massive food shortage for people to finally stand up to this tyranny, because according to Max Slavo in an article on SHTF's plan's website, they will not be afraid to use food as a weapon to keep the population trapped in this system, affirming that food shortages will come. And like the health crisis-related panic, this is a well-crafted plan of control. Slavo poses some questions wondering, is this what it's going to take to get the rest of the people to realize they've been controlled and enslaved by the very government who said they just want to keep them safe? He goes on arguing that safety has always been the rallying cry of tyrants, and that is no different now. People all over the world are waking up to what the power-hungry elitists and politicians have done to us for decades, but many are still sleeping. Will it take these orchestrated food shortages to wake them up, or will they continue down a path of slavery with no hope? The answer still remains unsure. However, the elite's plans are at full speed, using the typical government versus corporation fake rivalry to blame the state, not to have provided definitive safety measures for workers from the beginning, while exempting itself from the responsibility to take preventative measures rather than corrective ones. As reported in the LA Times, According to an International Brotherhood of Teamsters survey done in May, it's estimated there are at least 1.7 million workers at food and beverage manufacturing facilities, and at least 35% of these facilities have had at least one confirmed case of the infectious disease. However, roughly 80% of employers weren't tested and more than a quarter of the workplaces didn't allow employees to physically distance themselves six feet apart. Moreover, the conditions inside these plants can be quite crowded, 
and most fast-moving processing lines do not have enough space for social distancing. Besides, the predominant immigrant labor force also faces tough living conditions, at times making 10 people to share the same room. In other words, by using the government's delay in implementing the mandatory use of masks among workers as an excuse, perversely taking advantage of the health outbreak that caused the death of more than 1,000 employees of these food plants, to justify a reduction in the available workforce and, consequently, a lower production. Everything will be set for them to once again manipulate the narrative while putting the population on the edge, this time around maneuvering a threat of starvation. Not only in America, but many other countries are reaching the conclusion that instead of the current virus, hunger is what's going to annihilate a substantial amount of the world's population the New York Times said the world has never faced a hunger emergency like this, and the number of people facing acute hunger could double to 265 million by the end of this year. The scary disruption in the agricultural production and supply routes are already leaving millions worried across the globe. Logistical problems in planting, harvesting, and transporting food will leave poor countries exposed in the coming months especially those reliant on imports, said Johan Swinnen, Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington. In places like India, the lockdown is basically in order for laborers to starve. There, the health crisis had sometimes been called an equalizer because it has sickened both rich and poor citizens. But when it comes to food, the commonality ends. It is poor people, including large segments of poorer nations who are now going hungry and facing the prospect of starvation. When asked about this affirmation, a volunteer who brought food to families in the Nairobi slum area of Kibera after the fatal stampede, Asha Jaffa, has powerfully said that this disease has been anything but a great equalizer. It's been the great revealer pulling the curtain back on the class divide and exposing how deeply unequal the country is. On the verge of the 20th century revolution, Gramsci summed up assertively saying that the old world was dying, and while a new world was struggling to be born, it was the time of monsters, he said. Which leaves us with an eyebrow raised and wondering how long do the current monsters still have before we start to fight back. Historically, every time the ones in power have pushed the boundaries too far, expecting to reach a new level of domination, the shot got backfired. When they gradually and silently pushed their agenda forward to spread their dominance over aspects most people don't bother to hand over, they get the leverage they think it's needed to rule us as compliant sheep. Until they get overly ambitious and tend to bite more than they can chew. Whenever the middle class is slightly affected, and especially now, in times where information about class consciousness and about how fascism should be combated at all costs, with constant protesting already questioning the legitimacy of the structure we live in, it seems that the stakes may be too high. In addition to the evident social and economic implications, it is important to notice that typically after times of forged food shortages, when the industry gets back on its feet, we end up eating less and less real food and more food-like products. Oh, they repack, they rebrand, and even fund new pharmaceutical studies to market the new trendy diet that isn't actually any more nutritious or tasteful than what it was before, but it's definitely more expensive. In fact, their attempt to stop farmers' production is to debase small producers while letting large food processing facilities with whole hegemony over the products, because with fewer products and larger demands, small farmers won't be able to keep prices as low as big distribution centers will, and eventually they will go out of business too. According to NFU Vice President Tom Bradshaw, there are still concerns about the vulnerability in supply chains due to increases in costs, which have fallen onto the farmer and food producer rather than making their way through the food chain. 
they've got to make sure that long term, everyone can make a living out of producing the food we need, says Tom. But all is not lost just yet. By taking responsibility for our own maintenance and subsistence, instead of waiting to be rescued by these institutions, we can become more independent and actually free. In this channel, we have continuously mentioned the importance of developing self-reliance skills, particularly since as many of us are now at home and may seize the opportunity to learn and try methods to prepare yourself for the future, because we've repeatedly discussed how things are escalating to a breaking point. It is expected that a second peak in the wave of infectious cases numbers is to be all it takes to reinstall terror and anxiety by the fall, and how it's pointed in the article we've mentioned, obedience to the government won't save you. Preparedness might. With that said, you need to make the effort to become more reliant on yourself for your food, regardless of what the media reports. No matter what happens, self-reliance is freedom. This is often seen as difficult in our minds, but it can be done. Any amount of improvement in the area of food self-sufficiency will go far when the grocery store's shelves start to empty, as expressed by Ready Nutrition. There are many possibilities you can choose from and adapt to the space you have at your home. Using the advice of long-time preppers to try to help you to pass through these adversities with less trouble, we gathered some easy gestures you can make to prepare yourself by growing or preserving your own food. First, you can make a small research to figure out what kind of vegetables or fruits you can easily grow in your own yard or even a balcony. There are many types of seeds you can find online selecting your preferences and necessities. Another tip is to learn about edible plants since wild food is essentially free. The more you pick it, the more it grows. There are many books that can help you to identify these plants and ways in which they can be used for medicinal purposes. Also, canning food can be a great option if you have a place where you can store it. Canned beans, fruits, vegetables, meats, soups, seasonings can last up to six months with proper care. Even though we were left out by our leaders and were caught on a loop of constant exploitation and fear dissemination, there are still possibilities for us to find balance inside the chaos and to outsmart the ones who think that they control us by simply determining our own course in life, by taking care and preparing ourselves by our own means, literally taking the reins of our own lives.